Welcome to today's webinar, OBC Fiscal Year 2019, Transforming the Delivery of Family Justice Center Services, Creating New Pathways of Hope and Healing for Poly Victims, hosted by the Office for Victims of Crime. At this time, I would like to introduce you to your presenter, Stacy Phillips, Grant Management Specialist with the Office for Victims of Crime. Uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so good afternoon. This is Stacey Phillips, and I'm a Victim Justice Program Specialist at the Office for Victims of Crime um, in our National Programs Division. So I'm super excited to be here with you, and I'm going to take you through um, this webinar. Um, I think first and foremost, I want to encourage all of you to have your solicitation with you. If you don't, you should probably grab it, um, because as we go through the webinar, we're going to have things that are addressing things that are particularly in the solicitation, and there will be page numbers associated. So right off the bat, we'll start with the agenda. I'm going to walk you through. We're going to talk about the OBC mission. We're going to break down the solicitation by purpose, eligibility, goals and objectives, federal award information, the application deadline, award amount and timelines, as well as how to apply and questions and answers. So the OBC mission, um, OBC is committed to enhancing the nation's capacity to assist crime victims and to providing leadership in changing policies and practices to promote justice and healing for all victims of crime. So the purpose of this solicitation, you can see page four, is to enable the field to expand the work and lessons learned from the OBC fiscal year 2016 demonstration initiative, a pathway to justice, healing and hope, addressing poly victimization in a family justice center. Up to six FJCs or co-located service model agencies will be selected to implement the validated assessment tool, increase partnership, expand case management services to include a thorough understanding of the specific needs of the survivors and to build capacity within their communities to leverage existing and new crime victim resources. So in terms of the definitions, these can be found on pages five and six. So I'm not going to read them to you, but I will briefly just say that in terms of poly victimization, while there's not one universal definition, it is generally described as having multiple victimizations of multiple kinds, uh, having multiple perpetrators. In addition to hope theory, which also can be found on page six, hope is the belief that the future can be brighter than the past and that individuals play a role in creating that future. So there are two purpose areas for this solicitation, and you can see the details in the solicitation on pages 1, 5, and 12 through 13. For eligibility, we will discuss in coming slides. So we have purpose area 1, which are the FJC poly victimization implementation sites, and purpose area 2, which will be a poly victimization technical assistance provider. So in terms of eligibility, you can see this on page one of the solicitation. For purpose area one, the demonstration site, these are government agencies that serve as the lead agency of an FJC, government agencies with an FJC established as a separate department or program within a city or county agency, including tribal, nonprofit, non-governmental community-based domestic violence or sexual assault agencies that serve as the lead agency of an FJC, nonprofit organizations created expressly for leadership and management of an FJC, governmental and nonprofit organizations that serve as the lead of a co-located service center primarily serving victims of domestic violence and sexual assault with victim services civil legal services, law enforcement, and prosecution, federally recognized Indian tribal governments that operate a comprehensive co-located service center primarily serving victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, which involves victim services, civil legal services, law enforcement, and prosecution. And these must be federally recognized as determined by the Secretary of the Interior. In addition, Applicants must demonstrate an understanding of the area of victimization and comprehensive responses and services described in the solicitation and have the staff resources, organizational capacity, partnerships, and authority to develop or enhance programs. 
And you can find this on pages 11 through 12 of the solicitation. In terms of eligibility for Purpose Area 2 technical assistance providers, this can be found on page 2. These are nonprofit organizations, including tribal. Technical assistance providers should have a demonstrated history of providing national scope training and technical assistance and demonstrated expertise in working with FJCs, other similar co-located victim service collaboratives, and multidisciplinary audiences, the ability to manage a project of this scale, and the ability to bring diverse and multifaceted groups together to work towards a common goal. So in terms of goals of this solicitation, they are to support family justice centers or similar co-located service model agencies as they redefine service delivery to more effectively meet the needs of poly victims of crime. An initial, an initial planning phase for up to six months will be required for any site selected which was not part of the original FJC poly victimization initiative. And all grantee sites will be required to partner with a local researcher to conduct a site-specific project evaluation using an action research model. In terms of objectives and deliverables, for purpose area one for the demonstration site, from, excuse me, the, the demonstration site, they can be found on page seven. And for purpose area two, they can be found on page eight. All of the objectives and activities will be completed in close coordination with OVC's grant monitor and other partners identified by OVC. So in terms of Purpose Area 1, Implementation Sites Objective, these can be found on page 7. Within the first six months, ensure appropriate implementation of the assessment tool, a hope-centered framework, strategic planning process, identify new partnerships, both traditional and non-traditional, develop, develop new or expand existing MOUs, partner with the research entity, develop a learning exchange team, and coordinate with OVC and a designated TA provider. In addition, they will be developing or expanding those existing MOUs. A final report, these are deliverables by the way, a final report regarding the expansion of services and partners and how their poly victim survivors benefited from the changes as a result of this project, a strategic plan for the implementation of the assessment tool and for the delivery of services specific to the site designed to work in collaboration with the TA provider throughout the life of the grant to carry out the strategic plan. Also, implementation of the poly victimization assessment tool. These all can be found on page seven. Purpose area two for the technical assistance provider. These objectives can be found on pages seven and eight of the solicitation. Work in conjunction with the demonstration sites funded in FY 2016 to ensure appropriate implementation of the assessment tool. Work in conjunction with the new sites funded in FY 2019 as they prepare for tool implementation and ensure appropriate implementation, conduct a comprehensive review with new sites to assist with the identification of the population they are serving, their needs, and what services they are providing, conduct a comprehensive client mapping review for new sites, develop a plan for the comprehensive delivery of technical assistance to the new sites using a variety of delivery methods, connect initial demonstration sites with the learning exchange teams at the new site for technical assistance exchange, if applicable, and provide technical assistance to the sites in support of the site-specific strategic planning process. Provide customized technical assistance for the sites via phone, email, web-based communication, and in person. As far as deliverables for the technical assistance provider, these can be found on page eight. Share emerging information about the project with the field through webinars, conference workshops, blogs, and other communication methods. 
plan and deliver at least one all-sites meeting each year of the project and other deliverables as defined by the applicant. So on pages eight through nine, you'll see the federal award information and you can review it there. Under purpose area one implementation sites, up to six awards for up to 850,000 each for a 36 month period of performance beginning October 1st, 2019 and ending September 30th, 2022. For purpose area two, the technical assistance provider, one award of up to 1 million for a 36 month period of performance, again, beginning October 1st, 2019 and ending September 30th, 2022. Total amount anticipated to be awarded under this solicitation is $6.1 million. All awards are subject to the availability of appropriated funds and to any modifications or additional requirements that may be imposed by law. In addition, these are cooperative agreements. As for match, a match is not required. Information regarding match can be found on page 10 of the solicitation. Overmatching is not recommended but is allowed, becomes mandatory and subject to audit. Matching funds are restricted to the same use of funds as allowed for the federal funds. If it is not allowable under the federal amount, it is not allowable as a match. In terms of cooperative agreements, this information can be found on page nine. All awards will be made as cooperative agreements. As a cooperative agreement, there is substantial involvement between the awarding agency and recipients during the performance period. In addition, the awarding agency closely participates in the performance of the program. All solicitations are subject to Part 200 uniform requirements. More information can be found in the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide and the DOJ Grant Financial Guide. These details can be seen on page nine of the solicitation. Critical application elements. We have a program narrative that includes statement of the problem, project design and implementation, capabilities and competencies, a plan for collecting data required for performance measures, budget detail worksheet, including the narrative, and MOUs and letters of support for purpose area one, the implementation sites. Without these critical documents, the award will not proceed to peer review. You can find this information on page 11 of the solicitation. A breakdown for the scoring during the review is on pages 19 through 20 of the solicitation. In terms of the program narrative, this information can be found on page 11. Be sure to adhere to the program narrative format. If the program narrative fails to comply with these length-related restrictions, OVC may consider such noncompliance in peer review and in final award decisions. So restrictions include double-spaced, using a standard 12-point font, Times New Roman preferred, one-inch margins, not to exceed 20 pages. Program narrative details. Purpose area one, this information can be found in pages 11 through 13. And for purpose area two, this information can be found in pages 14 through 15. Parts for each, again, the statement of the problem, project design and implementation, capabilities and competencies, and a plan for data collection. And again, for the implementation sites for Purpose Area 1, they have the requirement of MOUs and letters of intent. On page 15, you can locate the budget detail worksheet and budget narrative. The worksheet and the budget narrative are now combined in a single document referred to as the budget detail worksheet. Applicants should use the Excel version. Breakout costs by year, reflecting 36 months 
total of project activity. Applicants can also see the budget preparation and submission information section of the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide for details on the budget detail worksheet and on budget information and associated documentation, such as information on proposed subawards, proposed procurement con contracts under awards, and pre-agreement costs. For questions pertaining to budget and examples of allowable and unallowable costs, please see the DOJ Grant Financial Guide. In terms of data collection, this information can be found on page 13 of the solicitation. You will be required to report key performance measures and required client data in OBC's online performance measurement tool, also called the PMT. This screen lists other documents to be included as mentioned on the application checklist on the last two pages of the solicitation. Use the checklist in your review prior to submitting your application. The submission deadline can also be found on page one of the solicitation. It is at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on July 8, 2019. So we're going to talk about how to apply, and this information can be, talked, uh, can be found on page 19. Applicants must register in and submit applications through grants.gov, a primary source to finding federal funding opportunities and apply for funding. Find information on how to apply in response to this solicitation in the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. The registration steps are outlined in the resource guide. There are lots of steps. I can't stress it enough to start early. Don't wait until the last minute. Applications are due July 8th, I'm saying it again, by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You must submit applications at least 72 hours prior to the due date. Call the grants.gov customer support hotline at the number listed on the screen 24 seven for technical difficulties. In addition, on how to apply again, seen in the solicitation on page 19, as well as noted in the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. This is important SAM.gov alert. If you are a new entity registering in the system for award management or an existing entity that needs to update or renew your SAM registration, you must submit an original signed notarized letter appointing the authorized entity administrator within 30 days of the registration activation. Notarized letters must be submitted via U.S. Postal Service mail. You can read this alert at www.sam.gov to learn more about what is required in the notarized letter and read the frequently asked questions to learn more about this process change. I'm gonna say this one more time. You must do this in advance. This is also very important. The following information must be included in your application. This might be repetitive. We say this because these items are required and scored during the application process. If you do not have these documents, in your, included in your application, your application will not be considered for funding. There is no way around it. So please make sure you include the project narrative, the budget detail worksheet and narrative, and MOUs if applicable as they are for the implementation site. All these documents are referenced on pages 11 through 15 and described in the solicitation. 
The review criteria is noted on page 19. If you have any questions regarding these documents, please ask. In addition, for purpose area two, again, this is very important. The following information must be included in your application. We say this because the items are required and scored during the application process. If you do not have these documents included in your application, your application will not be considered for funding. Again, there is no way around it. So please make sure you include the project narrative and budget detail worksheet and narrative. Again, all these documents are referenced on pages 11 through 15 and described in the solicitation. The review criteria is noted on pages 19 through 20. If you have any questions at all regarding these documents, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay, in terms of technical problems and requests for late submission, and this is really important and this is why we were stressing the registration information. An applicant that experiences unforeseen grants.gov technical issues beyond its control that prevents it from submitting its application by the deadline must email the OBC contact identified below within 24 hours after the application deadline to request approval to submit its application after the deadline. See page two in the OJP grant application resource guide. The applicant's email must describe the technical difficulties and must include a timeline of the applicant's submission efforts, the complete grant application, the applicant's DUNS number, and any grants.gov help desk or SAM tracking numbers. The applicant should include the name of the solicitation in the subject line or body of the email and include a copy of the dated notarized letter provided to SAM.gov for registration as well as any communication regarding this issue with SAM.gov and or grants.gov. To be considered for a waiver to apply, the date of the notarized letter must be before the closing date of the solicitation. OJP does not automatically approve requests to submit a late application. What I'm going to say here is also, I've seen it happen multiple times where people don't register SAM within those 72 hours or, or submit their application within the 72 hours and they believe that their technical issues have to do with regi the registration. OJP and OBC will not accept waivers that had to do with you not registering in time or not submitting your application in time. As far as attachment tips, OBC strongly recommends that applicants use descriptive names when labeling attachments, and it makes it much, much easier. In terms of adding attachments, this information can be found on page three for details. Grants.gov has two categories of files for attachments, mandatory and optional. We receive all the files attached in both categories. Do not embed mandatory attachments with another file. An applicant must use the add attachment button to attach a file to its application. Do not click the paper clip icon to attach files. This action will not attach the file to the application. After adding an attachment, select the view attachment button to confirm that you attach the correct file. To remove the file, select the delete attachment button. Again, all of this information can be found on the solicitation on page three. In terms of checking for errors, an application can be checked for errors through the Check Application button on the Forms tab of the Manage Workspace page. The button is active if the set of forms in the workspace matches those required in the application package. If you receive a cross-form errors message after clicking the Check Application button, 
Refer to the cross-form errors help article for more detailed information about this validation error. Tip. Here we are. I'm saying it again. <laughs> Start the application process early. Registration, dunssamgrants.gov. If you don't do this, it's not considered a technical issue. Make sure you identify your partners. Schedule planning meetings with your proposed partners. And begin now drafting and gathering those MOUs, because if they are missing from the requirements, your application will not be accepted and reviewed. Apply under the correct competition ID, OVC 2019-15643, and make sure you ask for the amount of funding needed. We're here at Q&A. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Mary Jo again. Um, we are going to start Q&A in a second, but before we do that, I'm going to go over um, a few items here that would be helpful to you. Um, there are some websites that are showing on the screen right now and um, that you might find useful. You can refer back to this slide later on after everything is posted. Of course, the OVC website is the first one that we, um, we have here, and it's www.ovc.gov. So you can go to that to um, find the solicitation as well as other future funding opportunities. Um, the next link here is the um, OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. And this is a great resource um, to go to when you need help or assistance and guidance on how to apply. Um, from this website, you can also access things such as the DOJ financial guide that was referenced before, the budget detailed worksheet, um, and other types of information that you could use while uh, moving forward with the process. In addition, OBC does have a training and technical assistance center. You can access that at www.ovctac.gov. That's OVC. TTAC.gov. Um, and then there's the grants management system, grants payment request system, and the grants performance measurement um, reporting system. So all those, inf all those items can be helpful in to you as you move forward in the process. Um, the other um, information that might be helpful, and you can reference this on page two of your solicitation, is the National Criminal Justice Reference Service. They are available to provide you with technical, or not technical, programmatic assistance and general assistance with regards to your solicitation. You can reach them at www.ncjrs.gov. If you do have a question about this solicitation after today's webinar, please feel free to email them at grants at ncjrs.gov. You may also call them at 800. 851-3420, and they also have a live web chat that is available. Their hours are 10 to 6 Monday through Friday and 10 to 8 um, when the solicitation closes. However, as Stacy noted earlier, you should submit your solicitation or your application at least 72 hours in advance, so you're not going to need that extra closing time, are you? Um, and you can also sign up to receive their Just Info newsletter and their funding newsletter. Both of these items will announce new resources and opportunities from the Office of Justice programs. The funding news resource letter, that comes out every Friday. It announces new solicitation opportunities from all the agencies within the Office of Justice programs. They will also notify and um, address any upcoming webinars and would let you know when uh, items from the webinars have been posted, so such as a PowerPoint and the recordings for today's webinar will be announced in that newsletter. Um, as Stacy mentioned earlier, grants.gov is where you're going to work to submit your application. If you do have problems, um, technical in nature, please contact them at 800-851-4726. They also have support at, at grants.gov as an email address. They are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, except on federal holidays. 
So at this time, we can start into the, um, the questions that we have here. Um, the first one, and this may have been addressed because um, it was asked before the webinar actually started, is there another registration for this grant in addition to our SAM registration? Yeah, so like we said, um, make sure that you register for SAM as well as on grants.gov um, and those sites that Mary Jo just went over. Um, and definitely make sure you do that because like I said, I know I've stressed it a few times and I've, I know I've said it multiple times and I'm doing that intentionally because it's really disheartening when, when entities work super hard on their applications and they get declined when a technical, uh, when it's noted that there was a technical problem um, and they're looking for a waiver because their application wasn't submitted on time. And then when they go back to the timeline, it turns out that they didn't register in time and they didn't get the notarized letter in time. And it really stinks on our end um, to not be able to give a waiver. Um, and, it, and we know how hard everyone works on these applications. So please, 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 please register early on SAM as well as grants.gov. Will sites who participated in FY 2016 be given time to develop a strategic plan? Page five of the solicitation says, oh, sorry, I thought that was a follow-up to the same question. My apologies. No, that's okay. Um, say that again, Mary Jo, I apologize. That's okay, I'm sorry. Um, will sites who participated in FY 2016 be given time to develop a strategic plan? Um, that's the, so right now you have a, it's a 60 day application period. And so you already have, to be honest, a, a step above anybody else because you've already gone through this, you know, the last three years and so, um, you should be incorporating that plan within uh, the requirements, um, you know, of the application, um, of the application submission requirements of the application period, excuse me. Um, the only reason that new sites are being granted um, in a six, up to a six month period um, for implementing the tool is because as, as you all know, the previous, I'm speaking to the previous demonstration sites, current demonstration sites, there was a lot that went into getting your FJC to where it needed to be to be able to do tool implementation appropriately. And so that's the only reason why new sites are being afforded that up to six month period to be able to do that. Page five of the solicitation says the tool was designed for both adults and children. Will we be required to implement the tool with youth in um, FY 2019? This tool includes information regarding, it includes the ACEs, which is what, it mean, was, which is what we mean when we say that it incorporates um, different assessments that would particularly be from youth, but this is particularly an assessment tool for adults. In response to data collection, um, number on page 13, Required in the narrative, so in response to the data collection, page 13, is that required in the narrative? Is the proposal narrative only to include questions A through C, page 11 and 12? Okay, so I'm gonna pull out my solicitation really quick just to make sure I give the correct answer. Data collection is determined by the performance management team, which is is from the performance management tool. But you're also going to be collecting data with your local researcher. And you're going to determine, um, based on your agency, what else you want to look at and what else you want to collect to ensure that this, is, uh, that this program is being implemented you know, to fidelity the way that you're designing it. So you will have a requirement on the OVC end for the performance management tool for that data but your local researcher and your agency will also come up uh, and determine what type of data you want to look, in, look at within your own system. And so that's what we're talking about also when we talk about a plan for collecting data. An MOU can be a single document with all partner signatures, correct? So 
that's definitely so an MOU is typically a memorandum of understanding with a particular partner and it outlines the requirements of what goes into that relationship. Um, there are many websites um, that will give you what information should go into an MOU regarding the scope of work and things like that. But an MOU typically does not include multiple partnerships because typically with partners, you have different scopes of work, you have different, you know, requirements and so, um, and, and different um, understandings. And so an MOU should be provided for each partnership that you have. If we have a current SAM, do we need a notarized letter? Um, my advice is that you just go back and make sure that your SAM is completely current. If everything is current, you should not need a notarized letter. However, I'm not, I can't speak on your agency itself. So I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to take care of that like now. And SAM and grants.gov will be able to tell you if you need to do another letter for some reason. There was a requirement discussed for Purpose Area 1 regarding having a local evaluator. If applying for Purpose Area 2, do we need to include an outside evaluator in that proposal as well? Give me one second. There is not a local evaluator um, requirement for the technical assistance provider. Is there, an, is there an amount of time your SJC needs to have been operational in order to apply for this grant opportunity? We are in strategic planning process now, but plan to be operational by the time the grant is awarded. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I encourage everyone to apply. Um, I'm just wondering how you would, I just know that in terms of um, getting underway that there are times that things don't always go the way we want, given our best efforts. And so I think it would be really challenging to meet all of the requirements um, of the solicitation if you were not already um, open. And so I think that's something you're going to have to think about. Um, I, of course, always encourage it. Um, because if you know for sure that you're going to be open, that I don't see any reason why you can't compete for the solicitation along with everybody else. But if you're not going to be open um, to serve clients, then obviously your application would not be able to be considered. Will we be required to submit tool data in FY19? Um, so that's a little bit challenging to answer because for though if, if new sites are selected, um, then they wouldn't have tool data because in FY19, well, this, this is not starting until, until October 1st. So they wouldn't have uh, information based on that. So um, old sites, are typically already utilizing the tool, and so they'll probably continue, you know, having that information for themselves. This is a follow-up to an earlier question. Does the 20-page proposal narrative only include questions A through C, or do we include responses to questions D and E within the 20 pages? Question D refers to the requirement of the MOU and question E discusses data collection. Those are additional attachments. So you should follow where we talked about the project narrative, um, the program narrative, and what is included in the program narrative, um, and the MOUs and letters in, of support, as well as the plan for collecting data are all uh, additional attachments. In addition to that, 
Under capabilities and competencies, most people typically uh, provide their resumes. Those resumes are additional attachments as well. Is it a requirement that co-located service centers involve partnerships with multiple organizations, or can they be run by only one organizing organization providing multiple service types? No, it should typically be multiple service organizations. It would be hard to service a, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, no, that's not possible, but it would be hard to have one provider that provided every single service, you know, that these survivors need because we have typically co-located service providers incorporate civil legal services, law enforcement, um, you know, maybe there's child services. Uh, maybe therapy, you know, there's so many different services that go under co-located services, um, especially with the Family Justice Center model or a co-located services model. So typically there would be multiple partnerships to be able to provide multiple services to be able to help the survivor holistically heal um, in every way possible. Are there any specific services that are required to be provided that at the co-located service center in order for an applicant to be eligible? And I think that kind of refers back to your last answer. Yeah, I would agree. Um, is there a suggested financial amount to allocate for our site-specific researchers? Um, my advice on that is to maybe talk to some other entities um, and find out what the typical um, amounts are for people and entities that have had, uh, you know, grants and cooperative agreements with us. Um, just make sure that your budget is reasonable and allowable. There are, you know, specific contracted amounts that have to be followed for government regulations, which again, those can be found in those additional resources that Mary Jo listed in the financial guide. Um, and so, you know, only you can make the determination as to how much you want to allocate towards that, towards that researcher. All right, so at this time, we do not have any further questions. Um, I will give you a minute or um, about a minute to see if anything else comes up, comes to mind. Um, again, as a reminder, if you do have any questions after this webinar has ended, um, you can submit them to the National Criminal Justice Reference Service. Again, their email address is grants at ncjrs. So the types of questions that you're asking here, if you have anything of that similar nature, you can submit it there, and they will work with Stacy to get you an answer as quickly as possible. Again, as a reminder, they are open to serve you um, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, they're closed on federal holidays. Actually, they're closed on holidays and um, on Saturdays and Sundays. Not all federal holidays are they closed, but some of them. Um, they will be open till 8 p.m. the day the um, solicitation closes, um, but you are recommended to um, submit your application at least 72 hours in advance. Again, as a reminder, if you have any technical issues with submitting your application or uploading any types of documents, contact the grants.gov customer service support hotline. Again, their number is 800-518-7426, and they are available at support at grants.gov. In addition, the important websites that were mentioned earlier one of the places I really would recommend that you start at is the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. They have um, several resources lo located there. In addition, they will provide you with links to the DOJ Financial Guide, the Budget Detail Worksheet, so a lot of the components that you need. So it's a good place to just start as a jumping off point. Let me just see if there's any other questions that have come through. Yes, a couple ones have come through. Um, do additional attachments, MOUs, plan for data collection resumes, count toward the 20-page limit for the narrative? No. Question
questions about disclosing pending applications. Is that only OVC applications or also OVW applications that are pending? Anything under Office of Justice Programs. All right, and that would finish up those questions. Um, I can give you another minute. We are at 1.54. The webinar is scheduled to end at 2 o'clock. So if I don't get a question here in the next couple minutes, we will end the webinar. All right, Stacy, I'm not seeing anything um, coming in. Um, are you satisfied? Would you like to, shall we end this? Yeah, and I just want to say good luck to everybody. It's really exciting that we're getting to expand this project. So um, we're really, really excited, and good luck to everybody that's applying. Um, and again, um, as a reminder, we will be posting the recording, the slides, and a transcript um, to the OVC website. So if you or a staff member need to go back and review anything that was um, discussed today, you can do that. Um, again, it'll take approximately 10 business days, give or take, uh, probably a little sooner than 10, but that's a good um, gauge. Everybody that registered for today's event will receive an email notifying them that that information has been posted. And with that, we will end today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us.